Thank you everybody for being here. So before we get started, the slides are already online, conveniently enough, because maybe you cannot see those. So if you just scan the QR code or you just go to this link there, I hope you can see it. Uh, you can basically follow the slides on your mobile phone. So probably if something is not clear, you have more time and yeah, you can check things even later if you want. So, okay, I want to start this talk with a question. Webpack equal pain, and I want to make you a question first, which is how many of you use Webpack already? Okay, that's a good number. How many of you think that this statement is true? Perfect, great. So I wanted to ask Twitter about this question, and these are some answers that I got. How much of a pain is to setting up Webpack? How to experience the pain? Create a webpack config that does code splitting, live reload, and source maps. Attempting to set up webpack, doing JavaScript the modern way, is pain. This is my favorite. Webpack is magic. It can be a severe pain in the heart. Damn, it's lovely magic. This one is great too. Hot new web stack called pain where pain stands for webpack, but anyway. Ors.js, of course you have to have something about Ors.js in a slide, which is webpack, remember how much of a pain. And this one is actually my favorite, it makes a lot of sense, and says you need to learn it well or else it's just a lot of pain. So the point that I want to make is that it's not webpack fault, it's just that module bundling is actually very complicated. So, hello everybody, I am Luciano. As you might have guessed at this point, I like Super Mario. And probably by my funny Italian accent, you also guessed that I am Italian. But I live and work in Dublin for a company called Vectra. Vectra is a very interesting company. They do uh, security and machine learning, or artificial intelligence, if you're talking to investors. And <laughs> basically, um, we are building a number of interesting products here in Dublin to do uh, automatic threat detection on a network and also to do research when there is a threat inside the traffic that was happening in the network. So I'm not going to take more time about this, otherwise Stripe will keep me out, but you can ask me later about Vector if you're interested. And there are some projects that I was working on my free time in the last three years that I hope will be interesting for you. One is a book about Node.js and design pattern that I wrote together with Mario Casciaro. Then there is Full Stack Bulletin, which is a newsletter that is aiming to provide content to full stack developers. And then there is Servers at Lab for all those people that want to learn about serverless on AWS. And there are also some free open source courses that you can do to start to play with serverless. So if you ever use one of those resources, please give me some feedback. I'd love to hear from you. So what are we going to talk today about? So first of all, why do we need modules? And then we are going to see some JavaScript module systems. Finally, we are going to try to understand how a module bundler actually works internally. Then we, I'm going to try this crazy idea of explaining Webpack in just two minutes. Maybe I'm going to take five, but let's see how it goes. And finally, we are going to see some advanced things that you can do with module bundling. So just to get started, I created this little app. It's just a simple to-do app. I promise if you use it, it's going to make you very, very productive. You can use it just clicking in that link. But it's really not special. I just want to show you that there are some features, like when you create an app like this, you will have to do DOM manipulation. And for that, I use a library called Zepto.js. If you have been doing web development in the last 12 years, probably you use it. And just because I think React and Angular and Vue sometimes are overrated. Then there is this other amazing feature, which is, which is a dynamic favicon, and shows you the number of outstanding to-do that you have. So if you click somewhere, that number that is seven, I don't know if you can read it, will be, for example, six. And there is a library to do that. Then there are those beautiful tooltips. You have a library for that. Then there is, this is my favorite feature, wait for that. Wait for that, it's coming. Yeah, so you have this confetti explosion for which, of course, you need a library. 
And then if you want to do local storage, there are libraries that will help you to store data in the local storage or also to create your unique IDs. So the point is you create this little app which literally takes you a few hours to build, but then eventually you have this code here, right? Looks good, right? More or less, because you have se seven requests only to load the JavaScript code. And this is the current scenario, but of course we know at this stage in 2018 that this is not ideal. What would be ideal instead is this. So compress, well, combine together all the vendors, so all the libraries that I'm using in a single file, and then import just the vendor file, and then my app logic. So how can we do this? And this is me literally doing this manually. So I'm gonna go in every URL, copy the code, and stuff it into a vendor.js file. Of course, there are better ways. You can build a simple bash script, or I created a little utility, a little probably useless utility, which will do that for you. And plus, this utility is gonna minify the resulting bundle. So the, the idea is to move from seven requests in the browser to two requests. And it's even better if you can minify these two resulting files. So okay, this talk is done, concatenation and minification, you know how to write performant with apps. But yeah, in reality this was good maybe 10 years ago. Today, I guess, we can do a lot better. And the reason why I think we can do a lot better is because today we have a set of different constraints. For example, we use a lot of dependencies. Most of you probably will use NPM and we, today are used to this flow whereby you can just say update this dependency for me and everything happens. We want to do the same when we are building web apps. And also we don't want to worry about dependency of, of dependencies. So for example, if you are importing a library that requires other libraries, you don't want to worry about, okay, which files do I need to copy and paste and where? You want this to happen automatically. And then you don't want to worry about the order of imports. So you just want to say, I want to use those libraries. I don't care about specifying them in the right order. The code should imply that for you. So, but what is really a dependency? If you check on Wikipedia, this is the official definition. A dependency or coupling is a state in which one object uses a function of another object. And sometimes we talk about dependency, but in reality what we really need is reusable dependencies. So this idea that you can just take something and port it to another project and it should work without much problems. And when we do that, it's better to call that dependency a module. So I'm gonna give you a, another definition, which is my definition of a module. And basically modules are the bricks for structuring non-trivial application, but also the main mechanism to enforce information hiding by keeping private all the functions and variables that are not explicitly marked to be exported. So the key keywords here are information hiding and exporting functionality. So, okay, we cover why we need modules. Modules basically allows us to export things and reuse functionalities across different projects or different organizations. Now let's see how modules works in JavaScript. But before going there, I want to introduce my friend IIFE, or some people like to call it IFE, so I'm gonna call it IFE, which stands for Immediately Invoked Function Expression. And to understand what IFE does, let's see how we generally define a function in JavaScript. We generally define a function this way with the arrow function, so the short format, or this other way, just function and then a return. At some point we are gonna use the function just by invoking it this way and assigning the result maybe to a variable. So the, the interesting part is that in JavaScript by default when you just declare a function, inside a function you have an isolated scope. That basically means if you see here I am declaring this variable and then when I try to print the variable outside, this variable is undefined. So the scope of this variable is only these two lines here. And we will see why this is important in the context of modules. So what IFI allows us you to do is that basically you define your own function and then you can basically wrap it with this expression. And what this expression does will basically immediately execute this function bypassing something from the outside scope. 
So basically you can keep everything nice and isolated here and when you need to pass something from the outside, you can do it this way. So some arg1 will be arg1 and some arg2 will be arg2. And this is a recurring pattern where we do JavaScript modules. So now that we know what is a module and we know what IFI does and what are scopes in JavaScript, let's try to implement our own module system. And this module system will need to do only two things, provide information hiding and exported functionality. So we have the module here on the top and then we will try to use the code from this module below. So the first thing to notice is that, I don't know if you can see it, but here and here we have this ify expression that will create an isolated scope. Then inside this isolated scope, we can declare uh, variables or functions that are private, that you want to use only inside this function, but you don't want to leak them outside. And then finally, we are gonna use, we are gonna declare an object that contains all the things that we want to export to the external scope. In this case, a public foo, which is a function, and a public bar, which is an array. And then finally, we use the return keyword to propagate this exported value to the outside scope. And you can see that this return, this value exporter, will end up to be assigned to this variable called my module. So at this point, outside from this module, you can do things like module, public foo, or public bar, and you can access this value that we exported. But if you try to use private foo or private bar, there is no way you can see the value that was assigned here. So, okay, now this is our implementation of a module, right? But it's not granted that everybody else in the world will do the same thing. So in reality, when we want to create a reusable module, we need to talk about a standard. And my ideal uh, module system will have these features. Like it needs to have a, a simple syntax for import and export, provide information hiding, allows to define modules in separate files. So ideally every module will live in its own file. And then you should be able to allow a module to import other modules so you can have nested dependencies. But also there are a number of features that will be nice to have like the ability to import only subset of a module. Imagine you have a module with 100 functions, for example, Lodash, and you want to import only one of those functions in your app. And then you also have to avoid naming collisions. You could have asynchronous module loading, and also it would be very, very nice if you could just import something and have this JavaScript code to work seamlessly in browsers and also on the server side, maybe Node.js. But you probably saw this coming. Every time we talk about standards, there is this situation where everybody thinks that no standard from the ones available is good, so somebody has to do the hard work to create the final standard that is perfect, and then eventually you have one more competing standard. And of course, JavaScript is no way different, and these are some of the standards, let's call them standard, that we have for doing modules in JavaScript. So you can simply use globals, CommonJS, which is the one used by Node.js, AMD, which is the one initially used by Dojo and then becomes more, become more standardized with uh, RequireJS. Then we have UMD, ES2015 modules, and there are many, many others like SystemJS. So let's go very quickly through a few of them. Global is basically the one that we used years ago when we were doing jQuery development when you just import a script and then this script will create variables in the global scope. So for example, here we have jQuery and jQuery will be assigned to this dollar thing and this jQuery variable and all the code is gonna create it through a if expression. So the, the, the problem with this approach is that first of all, it might generate naming collision. If you ever use jQuery, you probably had this problem where the dollar function was overridden by the jQuery module. Also, there is this problem that you need to import all your modules fully and in the right order, otherwise you could have weird race conditions, whereby in your application code, you try to access a module that is not yet loaded. And then you cannot import only parts of jQuery. Let's say you want to use only one function from jQuery, you need to load the entire module. 
Then there is common.js. I don't know why you see those scroll bars, but all the code should be there. Common.js basically allows you to define a module in its own file, and you just have to say module.export, and the object that you put in there will be available when you do this thing with require. So basically, when you require something, the object here will be assigned to the variable that you are defining in this point. So let's assume this is an implementation of low dash. We can just assign the module to the variable dash. And then you can use functionality inside the library, like the dot concat. Or you can also, using the destructure operator, you can only import some specific functionalities that you need, for example, the concat function. Common.js is very nice and has a nice syntax and also protects you from naming collision because you decide the name of the module when you start to use it. And also there is a huge repository. If you use NPM, I'm sure you all have used it at some point. But the problem is that it, it's built in a way that can do only synchronous imports, which means that it's something that can work only on the server because we know the browser is asynchronous by nature. So if we will see later what happens if you try to use uh, this import uh, require syntax in the browser, what happens? So there is another standard that is called AMD that tries to solve the problem of the asynchronicity and compatibility across the browser and server and has this syntax here. I don't know if you can read it, so I'm gonna go very quickly. You have to define a function called define and in this function you have to pass three arguments. The first argument is the name of the module the second argument is an array of all the dependencies that you want to use inside this module. And then there is a factory function that receives as argument all the dependencies that you need. And finally, inside this factory function, you can return something, and that something is the uh, functionality that you want to export from this module. And when you want to use it, it's a bit cumbersome. It requires a bit of configuration. You have to specify where to fire the files, if you want to have short names for modules, you have to specify all the paths. And then eventually, you can use it in your app by just saying define. This time, you don't have to specify a name because this is the main app. And jQuery is the dependency that you want to use. And then inside your code, jQuery will be available as a dollar. And this will automatically import all the dependencies of jQuery. So this is very nice because it works seamlessly in the browser and in Node.js. But the problem is, and that's my opinion, as a very verbose syntax, so I haven't seen much adoption of this specific module system. So there is also UMD that tries to unify those three systems. So you, if, when you have a module written in UMD format, it's going to work with your application regardless if you want to use global, CommonJS, or AMD, because it's going to figure out what is the context and load the module in the appropriate way. There are some extra slides that you will see when I publish them, if you want to see some examples, but I'm not going to cover the details. Same for uh, uh, ECMAScript 2015 modules. This is a very, very broad subject. The promise is that this module system is going to be the definitive module system. But again, it's a very broad subject that I'm not going to cover today, so you can check out all these links if you are interested. And I think next month we are going to have a talk dedicated to this. So, yeah, this was my feeling. There are so many options, what do we do? And I've seen that the most used practice these days is that you are gonna write your application by using either CommonJS or ECMAScript 2015, and then from that code that is not gonna run natively on the browser, you can create compiled bundles that will work on the browser. So there will be a middle step where you transform your code written this way into something that can work in the browser. And this is where we need module bundlers to actually solve this compilation, let's call it, of something that doesn't work natively in the browser into something that can work in the browser. So now we know a bit more about JavaScript module system. Then let's see how a module bundler actually works. So the first thing we have to do is let's try to use CommonJS in the browser. This is what happened. You put some code that is using require, and the browser immediately tells you, I don't know what require is. I've never seen that before, so I don't know how to execute this function. And this is because the browser itself doesn't support common.js, so the keyword require doesn't mean anything for the browser. 
So we have module bundler to help us with that. And as I told you already, you can take code that uses require and convert it into something that the browser can understand. And the first thing that a module bundler has to do is to build something called dependency graph. So let's try to understand what is it like. And a dependencies graph is nothing else than a graph that is built by basically define all the dependencies and how they are linking to link it together. For example, in this example here, we have our app and this app needs two modules. The first one is called dependency A and the second one is called dependency B. But then this module can require other dependencies themselves. So dependency A will need dependency A2 and also there is a shared dependency that will be used by dependency A and dependency B. So the first thing that a module bundler has to do is to understand for your given application how your dependency graph looks like. So this is the first part and it's called dependency resolution, but then there is a second part which is basically taking this information, this dependency graph and converting it into something that can work in the browser and will do the same thing that you expressed through the dependency graph. And this step is called packing. I'm going to explain you this better with an example. So basically here we are building an abstract application, which is like a calculator. So we have a number of different modules, app.js, which is our main logic, log.js that we use just to log values on the screen, calculator, which does parsing and resolution, and then we have parser and resolver as other modules. So a module bundler will start from your app.js. This is called entry point. And it's going to start to look for all the required statements. So the first required statements that we find is called calculator. So it's going to figure out, OK, this app needs calculator to do its work. But does calculator need something else? So let's see. Let's jump into calculator. And we can see calculator requires parser. So calculator needs a parser. And again, this goes on and on. Parser doesn't need anything. So we can jump back. And we see that calculator also needs resolver. Resolver doesn't need anything, so we can jump back to calculator and then to app, and we can find that there is another required statement that is log, so app also need log. So this way, the module bundler was able to build this dependency graph. And the way that this graph is represented internally is the following. Through an object where every time we find a new node, we create an entry, and the entry has a key and a value, and this happens for every single dependency. So the key there is basically the required part of that module. And then the, the value associated to that key is a factory function. And this factory function will receive two parameters. The first one is called module, and the second one is called require. But the interesting part is that in those three dots that I'm putting there, there will be all the code that is in that module. So in this case here, is parser, uh, sorry, is calculator. This is all the code for calculator. And the interesting part is that through this factory function, you are able to redefine the behavior of require and the value of module. So with this approach, we basically abstracted what needs to happen every time you use require and every time you reference module. And we will see in a moment why this is important. This is important because the next step, as I already told you, is to use this structure, this module map, and convert it into something that can run on the browser, which basically most of the time is just one single JavaScript file that you can just import in the browser through a script tag, and it's going to work and do everything that your app is supposed to do. So let's see how the packing work. And this is the key of this presentation, so pay special attention. I'm going to try to be as clear as possible. So you can see here that this is, again, an iffy, because you have here the parentheses. And here we are invoking the function uh, immediately passing some argument. And you might notice that this argument is actually our modules map. So basically what happens is that we are saying invoke immediately this function. And in the scope of the function, you will have something called modules map, which contains the object that we described in the previous slide. Then at this point, we are redefining the require function because, as I told you before, we are making this require abstract. So now we need to define the behavior of this require in this specific context. A require is nothing else than a function that accepts a name, which will be the name of the module. And then every time you invoke this function, you are basically describing 
the application how to load the code for that module from the module map. So basically the first thing we have to do is to create an empty object that will contain all the things that the module want to export. And then we are invoking the factory function for that module by passing the empty module object. And then we are also passing the require function again so that that module can require other modules internally. And finally, at this point, the code for the module will be executed. The module.export will be populated. And this is the value that we can return to the outside scope. And just to bootstrap this process, the first thing that we want to load is our entry point, which is the code for our application. So we don't want to say that Webpack is magic. So yeah, just to go very quickly through this again, we have the modules map. The modules map is loaded immediately. We redefine the require function, and then we invoke, every time we use a require, we invoke the module factory function to export this functionality, and everything starts by requiring our app. So at this point, you know exactly how things like Webpack work. So every time you run Webpack, Webpack will do all of this, probably even more, but we will get to that later. So you can write your own application by just using CommonJS, and you know that something like Webpack will do all this work for you. So I have a challenge for you. If you are very, very crazy and you like to build a crazy project, now you should have all the information to build your own module bundler. So if you do that, let me know. I will be very curious to see your implementation. And here I left a few tips for you. I'm not going to read those. So if you are interested in this challenge, you can read here some, some ideas on how to get started. And also, if you need an inspiration, there is a guy that actually built a little webpack and is super well commented. So this is something you might be interested in reading. So OK, at this point, we covered how Module Bundler works. I'm going to try this crazy thing of explaining Webpack in two minutes. So what is Webpack? A state-of-the-art Module Bundler for the web. So it does everything that we just described it and even more. How do you get Webpack? Of course, npm install something, and this something is Webpack and Webpack CLI. How do you use Webpack? You just say Webpack and app.js. And this works just because recent versions of Webpack are cool enough to work without config, but of course assumes that you will follow specific standards. So most of the time you will need to write some config. There is a very cool feature that you might want to check after this talk, which is mode development. If you do that, basically the resulting bundle file is going to be not compressed, so not minified to be accurate. And there will be a lot of useful information to understand what Webpack is doing behind the scene. So if you check this link here, I put an example. And basically, you can see all the patterns that we just described in this talk. So there is an immediately invoked function, an iffy here, that receives the module as an argument. So there will be a module map down below. And it's a bit different because they don't reuse the require keyword. They redefine their own Webpack require, but it's the same principle. And you will find down below this file all the other interesting things that we saw before. So the main four concepts of Webpacks are entry point, and we know already what that means. It's the first file from which we start to build the dependency graph. Then there is output, which basically is the place where you want to save the bundle files or all the files that are coming out from this bundling process. Then there are loaders, and this is the key concept of Webpack which basically are algorithms that will tell Webpack how to load specific files. So, so far we just saw JavaScript files, how to load JavaScript files, but with Webpack you can load a lot more. For example, TypeScript file, or Babel files, or even Elm or ClojureScript files. But it gets crazy enough that you can load even images and CSS. And if you have loaders that knows how to process those files, you can convert that, those into JavaScript. And then finally, there are plugins that can do extra things. For example, applying compression to images, if you want to apply the things that you learned in the previous talk. So a generic Webpack configuration is going to look like this. So the first concept, as I told you, is entry, is the first file that we have to observe. Then there is output, which is defined in the form of a folder and a file name. And then we have this big block, which is the thing that seems magic to most of the people. But basically, is the way that we can tell Webpack how to process files. 
So by default, you will have something like this. By default, Webpack will be able to process all JavaScript files. And in this case, we want to use as an extra Babel. So we are telling every time you find a JavaScript file, excluding node modules and Bower components, use Babel loader. So pre-process this file and convert it into something that can run in any browser by using Babel. And finally, we can use some plugins. And here I have a plugin that is basically creating for every asset the gzipped version of it. Now I'm going to give you another detail about how everything is a module. As I told you before, you can import all sorts of things when you use Webpack, like SVG. And then you can also load CSS. And then when you load an image, like an SVG, you can simply reference that, in this case, in your React code as if it's something natively in JavaScript. Of course, we know that you couldn't do that without Webpack. So the thing, again, is that Webpack can load any type of file as long as you can provide a loader that will know how to convert that file into something that the browser can understand. Here, there is another example. When we load CSS, basically what happens with this specific rule is that you can have a pipeline of different loaders. The first one is going to apply post CSS, which I don't know if you ever use. It's something like, I don't know, Stylus or other CSS preprocessors. And basically, will allow you to use extra rules that are not directly available in CSS, and they will be converted into something that is available in pure CSS and that can run on the browser. Then we use this CSS loader, which basically is going to figure out all the import statements and URL statements and make sure that those are respected into the final bundle. So probably there are some remapping of paths that has to happen. Webpack will take care of that through this loader. And finally, there is the style loader. So the result of these two steps is just a big chunk of text that needs to be loaded in the browser. This loader will basically create a style tag and inject all this text into the browser. So this is just an example. You can build your own pipelines. Some people will like to use Stylus. You just have to import the Stylus loader here. And that's it. Basically, you combine the, the, the parts that you need. So Webpack can do a lot more. For example, dev server, tree shagging, dependency analytics, source map, async require, module splitting. I'm not going to cover all these things in two minutes, because we are already over two minutes. But there are links here to the documentation, so you can see what are all these features. So as a last thing, I want to show you this project, Create React App, just because I think it gives you a very nice starter for Webpack, and it's very well commented. So if you never use Webpack, or if you always found Webpack kind of magic, the configuration you get with this thing is actually pretty helpful, because it's very well commented. So I want to do a little demo where we check together the code for the uh, Create React app. So basically here, I already started everything. And the first thing that we have with Create React app allows you, to, of course, to create React application, giving you sensible defaults. But the first thing that we get is that we can just start, run uh, yarn start. And this will create a dev server. So here we have our application running. And the first cool thing that we get with this approach is that if we change the code, which I loaded here, and we say, for example, hello, Dublin JS, oops, JS, when we save, the page is automatically refreshed. So while you develop this, uh, there is a Webpack server running behind the scene, and it checks for every file that is changed, and it's going to rerun the bundling process. And then there is uh, this thing called hot module reload that will figure out which modules actually changed and reload them in real time. It doesn't always work. When it doesn't work, it's going to refresh the full page. But still, you have the nice experience that you don't have to click refresh manually. And you can just edit your code in another screen. And in, a, in the main screen, you will see the application changing live. And this is one of the best features that you get by using a module bundler like Webpack. And then the other thing that I want to show you here is that if you use uh, this command called, uh, you see it here, yarn eject, all this configuration is hidden behind the scene with this create React app. But when you run eject, it's going to expose all the web configuration. So you can actually read it and change it if you want. 
So the configuration looks like this. You have two files, config dev and config prod, one for development and one for production. I'm gonna try to make it a little bit bigger. And honestly, I don't want to go in detail, but just to show you that you will find all the things that we described before. So the entry point, you will have a section with uh, loaders. So here you have modules with rules and all the loaders are here. And the funny thing and interesting thing is you, you will find all this thing commented here. So every time there is something that looks a bit magic or obscure, you can actually read this and it's gonna explain you what is happening behind the scene. And here, for example, you have uh, this configuration that allows you to load images and you can, for example, attach here a loader that will do all the images compression and optimization that we saw in the previous talk. So that's basically it for my demo. I don't want to spend more time because it's just going to be reading these comments together. I think you can do it in your own time. The last thing that might be interesting for you is that we have this webpack config prod which basically is gonna create a bundle that is optimized for production. So you are gonna run this only when you want to publish your website. And you can get this code by running yarn build. And this is gonna take a few seconds. And finally, it's gonna create a folder called build where you have all your assets in it. So you can see that there are CSS, there is your JavaScript code that gets smashed into this, but this is exactly all the React code that you were writing before using JSX, using Babel, using RequireJS, and all these kind of things. So, of course, Webpack is not the only possibility. There are other module bundlers out there. Parcel is becoming very famous because it has a very minimal configuration. Most of the time works even without configuration. Then you have Rollup that is very famous because it does tree shaking, so allows you to optimize the size of your bundle. And there are a lot of other options out there. So, okay, at this point we cover everything. So just to close up, I want to tell you that at this point I hope you believe that Webpack is not pain and it's not magic, because at this point you should know what's going on behind the scenes and you should be able to understand why some things are happening or why some things are probably not working. And then my suggestion is that you can always start small, so you don't have to add uh, Babel, you don't have to add the hot uh, reload, you don't have to add all this feature in the first go. You can start very simple and then add slowly bit by bit so that you can understand your setup. And finally, if you try to build your own module bundler, all these concepts are going to be much more clear and uh, probably it's going to be more interesting for you to experiment with different features of module bundlers. So that's it. Thank you.